Welcome everyone to the June 1st, 2020 Tanho Monday Text Study. I'm your host, Shirley Paulson of Early Christian Text, and our presenter this evening is Dr. Hal Tasig. In this study, we'll be talking about creativity in and rejection of Hebrews. That's from the book of the Bible titled Letter to the Hebrews. This book is often overlooked in both scholarly and religious practices probably because it doesn't fit well with conventional Christianity. But tonight we'll be looking especially at the creative metaphors for life in Christ Jesus. For its creativity alone, it deserves to share the limelight with the other lesser known books we've been studying. Just a gentle reminder that donations supporting the creation of these textual study archives are greatly appreciated. Five to $10 per session is enough to keep us going. You can find the donation link and the study, the uh, text that we're studying tonight, more information about past and future study sessions, as well as other archived recordings on the Early Christian Text website by clicking the button on the home page that says Tanho Monday Textual Studies. So Hal, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Shirley, and thank you all for coming. Um, uh, Hebrews, is, uh, as Shirley alluded to, has got to be about the most important and popular book in the entire Bible. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly anybody ever reads it. Um, and, it's, and it's been understudied by, by scholars as well. Uh, and so one of the reasons that it seemed to me that it might be fun, interesting, and, and helpful, maybe even inspiring, to, to study Hebrews for an hour together had to do with really Shirley's lead in her, in her work in which she talks about studying the Bible and beyond. Mm -hmm. And so most of the time when that happens on, on the fourth Mondays, we do then indeed look at the beyond of of the bible and beyond and in in that way we have been trying to catch up with the fact that there are more than a hundred new discoveries of texts in the last 150 years um, of texts that were written in the first 200 years in other words there have been more texts discovered in the last 150 years than in any than in the thousand years before. So Shirley's um, naming her work as the Bible and beyond claims that there's connection between all of these <clears throat> new newly discovered texts um, and and especially the New Testament. One of the first ways that people respond to the newly discovered text of the last 150 years is to say, wow, that sounds very strange. Mm -hmm. um, and who could fault someone uh, for, for saying that? In that, what we have, I think uh, it would be fair to say, is that um, Christianity has domesticated the texts in the New Testament. That is, study has been focused on that. And so therefore, if we had studied, let's say, the gospel of truth um, or the gospel of Mary uh, for 1,500 years, we might not think it sounds strange. Um, but by and large, we have this really curious, but I think underneath the surface, very powerful and inspiring thing that has happened um, to basically um, Christianity. And that is that it has a whole lot of new stuff, much of which hasn't been really studied very much. And even more of which has been called heresy um, or bad literature just because we haven't studied it that much. 
I can say for myself, and some of you have heard this as well, that that was true of me. So I'm, I'm, I'm a really old person. Um, and <laughs> and um, for the first 20 years or so of my career, that would be about halfway through my career, I had no really notion. I had my PhD and everything, but hardly anybody taught me anything about the new, newly discovered texts. Um, and only in the last 20 years, uh, despite um, my resistance, have I um, found, thanks to many people in the public sphere, um, that the, the newly discovered texts are, are very um, engaging. So back to the letter to the Hebrews. One of the most fun things for me about the letter to the Hebrews, and it may not even be a letter, um, is that it may be really the only text in the New Testament that people treat like the newly discovered text. That is, they don't really know anything about it because it has not been a part of what um, many people would call the master narrative of Christianity. That is the stuff that we're supposed to know. And somehow the, sp the stuff that, and I, I should say, I hope that not all of you are Christian. It always helps study. Not everybody's Christian. Um, I happen to be one, for better or for worse. Um, and um, uh, so basically, uh, there has been no way into the book of Hebrews, by and large, for most people, most cultures, and, um, and most frames of reference uh, in terms of belief or history. Uh, so why not um, uh, dip our toes in? We won't be able to do too much more than that um, because it's a relatively big book. It's bigger than most of the books in the New Testament. Um, but um, it's, uh, we, we uh, will need to stay at much of the beginning of, of what the content is just because it, it will be so, um, because most of us, including myself, are um, fairly ignorant of Hebrews. So let me just um, say a few more things about the, of the beginning of what Hebrews may look like. Um, and then I'm going to stop, and as usual, um, we will want to really be in conversation this evening, not me just blabbing on to you. So what I'm really interested in um, is for you to um, uh, think as, as we're going along and ask questions, have protests, um, think, think about um, um, where you are in relationship to what gets sort of laid out. But first, and before we do that, let me say just a few more things about um, Hebrews. Um, when was it written? Uh, and again, many of you know from um, uh, talking with me, um, uh, mo my best answer on these kind of questions is we don't know. And that's especially true of Hebrews because not many people have studied it much. Um, when I was in seminary um, and in, in graduate studies, um, they told me um, in the two paragraphs that they told me about this, um, they told me um, it was probably in the late first century. Um, it feels to me like that's a kind of a plus or a minus. That's probably uh, what those who are studying Hebrews more now would place it a little later than that. Um, uh, who wrote it? Um, uh, it's very difficult to say. Uh, there's not a, a, a name attached to it. Um, in most of the early documents, um, the title is left out, as is the case of many uh, 
uh, texts of the New Testament. Um, uh, so the title, the letter to the Hebrews, is almost certainly later than the composition of the book. Um, uh, we'll talk a bit more in a, a bit about the letter to the Hebrews, whether that um, stands up or not. And I want to say it, it, it kind of stands up, but, it, but it's bizarre and fascinating in the way that it does stand up as a as as related to what one might, we might call the Hebrews. Um, there is no story in the letter to the Hebrews, and it it sometimes sounds like a letter, and it sometimes sounds like what one might call a sermon or a lecture. Um, it has quite a bit of poetry, um, and it uh, and its text is focused on a a picture of Jesus that is nowhere else. Um, it's a fascinatingly um, different Jesus. Um, if you think that, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas um, uh, sounds sometimes strange as, as really Jesus, even though there are 114 sayings by Jesus in in that, wait till you get a hold of um, the the epistle to the Hebrews. Um, uh, so, for instance, um, Jesus is really often called the sacrifice in um, in the letter to the Hebrews. That's a a, a notion that's almost completely evident. Um, um, completely uh, non-existent in um, most of the gospel. It's mostly a later um, uh, notion in terms of uh, when Christianity finally got started. Um, similarly, um, at the same time as Jesus is um, uh, the sacrifice, or sometimes a sacrifice, um, Jesus is also the priest. Now, again, we know from the canonical Gospels and, and from things like the Gospel of Mary or the Gospel of Thomas that Jesus doesn't act like a priest in any of those Gospels. So this isn't the Gospel, so you might say, well, why doesn't that kind of text try it on? Um, so we'll be really interested in, in um, Jesus in those two ways, but that's only one of about six different primary titles for Jesus in the, in the letter to the Hebrews. In other words, it is not consistent as, because it's not a story, it's not like a story of someone being sacrificed, nor is it a story of someone being a, um, a priest. All right, I'm going to stop there um, for a moment to uh, for you to catch your wind or catch the sail or something like that. Um, let's see um, what things you want to to think about. Um, I hope I'm assuming that some of you, which usually happens, some of you probably read the letter to the Hebrews before. I'm seeing heads shake. Amazing. Um, that you actually, some of you did, and I'm assuming that uh, some of you didn't. Um, but let's just stop and see uh, what um, what you'd like us to talk about, or what um, um, what I said was confusing. Okay. Can you can you give us a little bit of a feel for what um, the what the Hebrews, what the Jewish people were thinking about sacrifice around the end of the first century? Like what the context of the idea of sacrifice at that time? Yeah, I think I can do that. Um, uh, so especially that is a big deal question because by the end of the first century, the temple has been destroyed. Um, so I think what most 
uh, people of Israel, I would call them, um, um, uh, meaning not just in Israel, but people um, who think who say they belong to Israel, even though they might live in in Rome um, or or Egypt. Um, so m what most people would be saying about sacrifice is, I wish we had one at the end of the first century. That is, there is, because, and that's probably an overstatement that there wasn't anybody sacrificing that belonged to Israel, because we do know that there were some, there were a few temples, and one especially, especially a temple in Egypt that belonged to the people of Israel. And it could very well be that there was sacrifice um, there, but the, the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by Roman uh, re-invasion. Um, so uh, that's one of the key things that's happening to people at the end of the first century. They're saying, I don't know who I am because, the, because sacrifice at the Jerusalem temple was so important to me. And let me just say another word about what they mean there. Because what happened there, and um, often we, a lot of us uh, forget this, but so if you go to the temple before the year 70, and you are participating in the rites of the temple, the temple is a pretty huge um, building, um, and there's sacrifice going on all the time. Uh, and the sacrifices are, by and large, a big meal that's going on in the temple. Uh, uh, the, and the, the people that are eating it are the regular temple goers. It's the main people. Who eat. So you go there, and, and it's smelling like... Um, uh, meat being burned, and there are people who are attending at, at the temple, and they, um, they're serving uh, um, uh, all kinds of people who are making a meal. The, 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 um, the priests are eating, by and large, often with the rest of the, uh, the, the folks. And then the main person who's eating is God. So God's with you um, in that. And um, you can see God eating it because the, the smoke rises. And, and that's God eating the sacrifice with you. So anyway... Um, that's, that, so you have felt that for so long and at the end of the first century when Hebrews is, has been written, you're thinking, oh, wasn't that beautiful when we were all, hundreds of us were eating together at the temple, singing and talking. Um, uh, uh, Again, that Christians have thought differently about um, uh, sacrifice, and and moderns don't know what to think of the fact that many temples around um, the Mediterranean, whether they're related to uh, Israel or not, um, are having a great time having huge meals together at the temple. That's a, enough on that, but that gives us one, one thing going on. And I, no, let me say one other thing, because surely you, as usual, are really um, putting us right into the heart of the, of the question for the evening, and that is. So Hebrews, then, I want to say, is almost certainly written about the loss of the temple. One of the main things that this is about is that there is no more temple. Mm. And then the thing that we need to get our head around um, as, as, uh, as we realize that is the, probably the biggest uh, topic in Hebrews is the temple. 
and how Jesus is um, helping us all participate in a new and bigger and better temple. Mm -hmm. That's the story when everybody is still just completely grieving at how the temple has been lost. Hmm. Other thoughts, along questions, with, protests? Yeah, how along with that theme, um, the theme of sacrifice, I think what, I've, I, what I was reading out of this was that the, uh, the temple, or, that Jesus is the sacrifice for all of us now, and we don't need to have the temple to sacrifice anymore. One of the commentaries I read says that the book was written in Greek and filled with Jewish Im imagery. So the recipients probably were Greek-oriented Jewish Christians. And these believers seem to have wavered in their faith when they were faced with adversity and suffering because of the gospel that was being preached. And they also questioned whether Christ's sacrifice really dealt with their sins. So it had become increasingly tempting to abandon Christ and return to their former life of Judaism. And the author, this, this says anyway, essentially asks, since Jesus is the re supreme reality that everything else anticipates, why leave him and return to a pale imitation? Mm. Comment on that for me? Yeah, it'll only take us about three minutes, Judy. That's good. Um, <laughs> no, no. Okay. No, 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 no. That, no, that's a, you, that's a really wonderful mouthful um, that you just laid out. And thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, uh, I would want to say that you all should take very seriously what Ju Judy just said, and then add the following to this. Um, uh, there was no such thing as Christianity at that point. Uh, in other words, they couldn't go, um, there was, the word Christian actually doesn't exist until fairly deep into the second century and that only in a minor way. And if you ask who are the Jesus, the various kinds of Jesus people, if you ask them, they would all say whether their mother is Jewish or not, and that's the sign of being Jewish, right? They would all say, we belong to Israel. And then if you had said, wait a minute, Israel doesn't do, do this or this or this, like you're doing this. Well, the, what happens uh, in Israel, not only uh, then, but now, is Israel does not have, Israel as a spiritual home, does not have somebody in charge. So both today and in the first century, there's a lot of leeway in how you belong to, to, to Israel. Um, and, and, and so, for instance, what you'll see in, in the New Testament, let's say, um, sometimes Paul or Matthew fighting with somebody who says they're a Judean. Um, uh, but that's just like the people of Qumran fighting with the people who were in the temple in Jerusalem, or the people in Greece who are belonging to Israel, fighting with the people in Egypt, or then especially since Egypt has so many people of Israel, more than Israel has itself at that time, there were like six or seven major directions there. So that's that's important. So there is no, no, no Israel to go back to. You're just a part of a big, diverse Israel. And everybody kind of likes fighting. Um, um, and that's just how you learn to be belonging to Israel is part of it is having good arguments. Um, uh, uh, so, so you can see um, that. The, the other thing I would say, uh, Judy, about what um, is so important that, that you have seen is is that um, 
four, so you have about us maybe a generation and a, a, well, you have a, maybe a generation or two of Jesus, various kinds of Jesus people um, before the temple is destroyed. And we know that some of those people are going to the temple to sacrifice and have a meal, in addition to having a meal in their home, like, um, for, like for instance, the, uh, the um, Pharisees do. Pharisees often will go home for their meal. Um, uh, uh, but, but there are a whole bunch of ways of having a meal to celebrate God's goodness. Um, uh, in, in in Israel, so um, uh, the, there was not much time for the Jesus peoples to get going in one direction before they lost the temple. They too felt that as a loss. So this is where what you said, Judy, is so cool and wonderful is it, it it you can palpably feel loss in hebrews by its overemphasis on no 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 everything's okay and the, it's a great temple that we have it's a spiritual temple um so anyway thanks judy for getting us started on that other other um Comments, protests. I have a question. Uh, yes. maybe, maybe two questions. Uh, Hal, first of all, I really loved your idea that, or your point that Christianity domesticated the New Testament. Um, I would say probably it was harder to domesticate Hebrews as, as we've known, um, as we've been talking about this evening. But I have two questions. Uh, knowing how early uh, the book of Hebrews is, um, is there any relation at all to the Ebionites that came much later? Because they were a very Jewish-based, and, and because Hebrews is such a Jewish-based, why aren't there any, any focus on the apostles? Because they were of the Jewish base of the Jesus followers. And then the third thing is, how in the heck did it get in the canon? <laughs> oh, those are... Research on that. Those are two big questions. Let me uh, do the the what we uh, I, I you'll see you'll watch me dance around the word Jewish because um, the the, he, the the Greek word doesn't really come until the second century um, uh, to to mean anything like that. But um, uh, so it is really true what you I have been reading those of you, if you have that there's tons of stuff about Israel in Hebrews. Um, almost, I mean, every fourth verse has some quote of a, of a text um, uh, from it. And here's the amazing double take. The other main thing going on in Hebrews is Platonism. Platonism, of course, is the major, uh, or Neoplatonism at the, in the first and second century CE, is the main philosophical um, framework for the entire Mediterranean. Um, it, Neoplatonism is kind of a, an updated version of what Plato did. Um, four or five centuries before, but it's really popular. Um, and almost everybody thinks with Platonism, even if you're a, a, um, of, of, of Israel. And let me just, I, I can't, we can't talk too much about Plato, but I, we have to talk some, right? <laughs> to, to, so one of the big deals about the framework of Plato is that there is are two realities. There's the ideal reality and the flawed reality. And what Plato says is there's an image of everything, of every person and everything. And you have the ideal or the what he would Plato would say that's the actual reality of a tree. 
is the ideal one that is in the sky or is in the above. And the rest of us are simply problematic images of the realness in the sky. He doesn't mean heaven or anything like that. It's just like a, a, a diagram that all reality, all pure reality or idealness is above and everything below is flawed not like it's it's sinful but it's just not up to snuff now it so if you read and i would want to say probably since this is not by and large taught in um in the few books about the about hebrews um, it's been taught really in the last 20 years, but not much before. Um, uh, so uh, if you read Hebrews, it's the um, perfect temple is above. The perfect, uh, Jesus becomes the perfect priest when he goes above. Everything that is good from God comes from above. And this is, it is just right down the Platonist um, framework. So look at what, what is going on here then that is totally interesting um, is you have a book full of citations from Hebrew scriptures. And you think about it Platonistically. Now, um, what's interesting here is that that's not unusual for a bunch of thinkers of that day of Israel. Um, uh, so the main example here is the great is a, a person of Israel who lives in, um, in Egypt called Philo, one of the greatest writers of the first century. Philo is, is a passionate follower of Israel's God. He's never lived any place but, um, but Egypt along with about 300,000 other Israel people. And he is a great intellect. He's written nine big books. And what he says is that the message of Plato and the message of Israel's God is exactly the same thing. And, and, it, and it takes him nine really long books to try to prove that. Um, uh, so what I want to say, first of all, Helen, is um, that um, unless we know about how deeply um, Greek uh, Hebrews is, uh, we're missing the boat. Yeah. And, we, and then we have to say the same thing about how much full of Israel it is. Yeah, that, that's just fascinating. And I, I'm remembering that one of the things that just bowled me over at the Westar conference was when a scholar said that the Christian, earliest Christianity had more to do with, with Plato. Yeah, right. <laughs> As to the Gospels, I went, whoa. Um, so, but that, does that actually maybe place Hebrews in Egypt among that? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, if I had to guess, I mean, I, I, that would be the best, the best piece of semi information I can give you about the who, what, where, when of of Hebrews is it it it's just smells so much like Philo, and and looks like Philo, and then is different than Philo in some other ways. But but because because we know actually there were so many people of Israel in in Egypt 
at that time that they had built at least one really big temple. And the people of it, the people of, of Jerusalem thought that was anathema. I see that. Thank you. So, so let me say a few more things um, as we plod along, and you can see how tr much trouble I'm in um, in terms of getting anything coherent um, uh, in in an hour. Uh, but um, what I want to say is the most wonderful thing for me about Hebrews is how much it is of its own of its own self. It's it's a it's it's trying to work out a new picture of how God is working in this time, and it's slapping a whole bunch of things together. Not it knows better than to have a story because it's just too soon to have a coherent story. Um, and it likes so much other things that are going on from Israel and from, from Greece that, that um, it is, it, it's just a, an, a big, long experiment. Now, here's the second thing I want to lay alongside of that. Um, and again, we'll, those of you who, who um, join us every fourth when, uh, uh, Monday, it's um, uh, this can may come together in September when we're talking about something else. But what I want to suggest is the uh, I want to contrast Hebrews uh, with two later almost Christian in one case and, and really Christian things in, in another case. So um, does anybody know what the uh, diatessaron is or diatessaron? Good, a couple of hands up there. That's a, a book written at the end of the second century by Tatian. He's a, he's a Jesus person and he knows the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, probably also Mary and uh, Truth and and um, and Thomas too, um, and and a couple of others. But he has the idea that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John seem to be pretty popular, even though they disagree with one another. Um, so what? Tatian does is he takes parts of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and puts them into one story so they fit together. Let me say alongside of that, um, uh, uh, the um, Nicene Creed, two centuries later, right? Than Tatian, or two, uh, one and a half centuries later. So, um, as many of you know, um, uh, the Roman emperor of, of uh, uh, that brought the, the, who had become a Christian in the early fourth century, he was so frustrated because all of the Christians were saying different things, and he said, "If I'm in charge of the empire, I got to know what's what," and he brings most of the bishops together in the early fourth century, places them under house arrest and says, you're not getting out of here until you tell me what the real truth is. And they do. And that's the Nicene Creed. The, so in other words, in the early fourth century, that also is kind of like Tatians, the Atesaron. It's something that fits together. Now, it's, when you look at the Nicene Creed, it's a little funny because, of course, as you may know, um, some of you, I bet you some of you re, um, recite the, the, the Nicene Creed. Um, if you recite the Nicene Creed, you'll notice that not, no, Jesus does nothing in the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed skips all of Jesus' teachings and all of his life. It's, it skips from Mary's 
Mary giving birth to him, to him dying. Not, so in other words, Jesus doesn't do anything but get born and die in the Nicene Creed. So, but these two, the 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 Atessaron and the um, and the Nicene Creed, are rare examples of the early Christ people saying um, this is going to fit together all really nicely. And what I want to propose is that the real version of early Christ people is something like Hebrews. Not because it agrees with everyone, but because it, like almost everyone else, is doing different things, putting different images together to, to capture a kind of vivacious way that's grabbing their lives. But they're, everybody is doing creative things that are different. Um, and, and that's why I love Hebrews, because it's so much itself. For us to, uh, we have to skip a lot of things in Mark or John if we want to have a coherent story. Because Mark and John, for instance, don't have the same story. Um, uh, so, um, and let me give you an example of Mark and John for, for just a moment. So in, in Mark, um, Jesus um, uh, hardly ever talks about himself and talks in parables. In John, Jesus talks all of the time in long speeches. In Mark, um, Jesus ends uh, his life on the cross screaming at God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the only thing Jesus says in Mark. Whereas in John, Jesus, Jesus is so at ease on the cross, he's taken care of his mom and he's taken care of his friend. And then he says, ah, it's finished. Uh, so in other words, these are really different pictures. But I want to say that's what actually the New Testament really is about, is a whole bunch of creative, different pictures. Or as Irenaeus um, at the end of the second century said, he wanted uh, everybody to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because they were like four winds that blow and they were at four corners of the earth. In other words, Irenaeus, likes those four Gospels because they're different. And I want to say, here's to Hebrews, <laughs> just in that same spirit. Okay, let me see, see whether I've lost you um, uh, and, and what, you, what, what you need to think about um, more or differently than the, the way I was just talking. Well, while, while we were talking... Um, it sort of it was made it made me think about looking at a different parts of the Bible a little bit differently. So mm. sacrifice to me when I hear sacrifice, the one of the first things that I think about is um, in other parts of the Bible where it talks about sacrifice of giving a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and. So just thinking about how wh how Hebrews is talking here and about faith, how how much it talks about faith, which mm -hmm. is a lot. I mean, you know, Thanksgiving is sometimes can it, the way Jesus was talking about things. It is off of faith. It isn't necessarily what you're seeing in front of your eyes, but he was very thankful. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. how to do yeah. that. You know, he was living that. He was showing that sacrifice. And um, so I was looking, I was just looking up Thanksgiving while you were talking and, you know, seeing how many places said sacrifice of Thanksgiving, because I'd forgotten that. And so I was looking at other parts of the Bible that had that word Thanksgiving. And so our discussion kind of makes me want to go look at all the places in the Bible where it says, where it uses that word Thanksgiving and think about, well, what would happen if I replaced the word Thanksgiving with sacrifice? 
what mm. kind of different meaning might that might that have um and then just kind of looking at hebrews in general you know rereading that at with that perspective of how how does sacrifice you know being having a sacrifice of thanksgiving um and living that how does how is how does the book talk about that so that was what i was getting from things oh that's wonderful that that that's exciting to see you just going after the 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 particular voice of hebrews and especially what what's what sacrifice where sacrifice and thanksgiving come together in hebrews Other thoughts as we go on? Um, uh, I'm thankful for uh, you uh, putting this together because uh, I was uh, joking with my friend earlier saying in our tradition uh, in the black church, Hebrews 11 is where we always like to go to. Um, but we don't really, you know, dive into the whole book. Um, and so, uh, with what's going on now with uh, COVID-19 and not being able to go to church, and that's a big thing, um, but recognizing that it's a new thing that we're trying to do in the church, Hebrews now becomes something important that I, I think I need to introduce. <laughs> um, but the whole piece on faith and sacrifice um, from the Hebrews 11 chapter, um, where they kind of have a Sankofa moment, going back to see all of the other um, saints who let faith lead them and using that to now go forth. Um, I think the whole sacrifice is taking the faith and sacrificing um, what you see before you um, to, to go beyond that. Uh, and we do that a lot with Hebrews 11. Um, even now, I've preached it a lot. I've used it a lot in my own terms. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a good take. Now, my question, I do have a question about Jesus becoming the priest. Uh, I remember in seminary when we had to read um, 1 Samuel and how we learned that a priest usually didn't have a called narrative um, and that it was like the book of First Samuel was just kind of to legitimize the priesthood um, in the in the whole context of, of leadership. And so could is this why Jesus becoming the priest is important in the Hebrew? Because they want to hold on to some tradition, and so they have to now uh, make Jesus a priest uh, for the importance of tradition. That's my question. Ooh. Reverend Stephanie, you just keep getting us going. Thank you so much on that and for bringing in all of that. Um, so um, again here, Hebrews has an amazing twist when it comes to um, priests because Hebrews goes out of its way to say he is you know, like the priest. And then he, and then Hebrews um, frames it in all of the language of the temple and of Israel. But to start off, um, Hebrews says, and he is a priest according to the, uh, to the um, priesthood of Melchizedek. Melchizedek never gets to Jerusalem. Melchizedek isn't even from Israel. And, and so um, Hebrews even shows how the one place that there is Melchizedek in the entire Bible, which is in Genesis, um, there um, um, Melchizedek, who is a foreign priest, blesses Moses. And then the Hebrews goes on out of the way to say, notice who's in charge here. Not Moses. 
but Melchizedek. Um, so in other words, this, this clearly is, from my point of view, um, an unbelievably experimental picture of Jesus in that it is so full of Israel, so full of Greece, and now is, he, he's, he's a priest that doesn't belong to either. Um, uh, and, and so um, if you're reading in the first or second century, if you're reading um, Hebrews, you, you, you see the claim of a new kind of spirit that it says integrates both Plato and Israel's God in the form of somebody that's neither. Um, so you, and here I would wanna say, we could probably do the same thing with Luke, right? As to how experimental it is in, in terms of it's his own voice. Um, see, the way, again there, if we wanted to say, what, what's Luke's story? We'd have to leave out a whole bunch of Matthew, Mark, and John, because Luke's got its own thing cooking. Um, and and, and it, so it feels like both Israel and the cr early Christ people are quite relaxed in thinking out of the box. How ironic, huh? That now we see the New Testament as a box. But we saw that with the Ode. You know, yep. I got to say with the Ode. So yeah. The well, tell us a little bit about the Odes there. <laughs> well, um, I'm trying These to are like the Odes of Solomon. The Odes of Solomon. And so we see that the, the, the early Christians in the writing of the Odes take this approach um, which is revolutionary. You know, Jesus isn't what they told us he was. Jesus isn't what in the box that they put him in in any of the gospels. Jesus, you know, and you don't even hear Jesus, you hear Christ. Um, and there's dialogue uh, within that. And so doing a new thing with the theology same thing's happening here with Hebrew, right? Because they're doing a new thing. They're, they're taking the the they're taking the faith outside of the traditional box because they have no choice, right? Right? How many people had to learn how to use Zoom in the past six weeks? Because if you wanted to participate in church, you had no choice. Right? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's kind of the same thing that's going on here with Hebrew. Also going on with the old, right? Because um, it's, it's a whole new time. It's a whole, how you apply your faith. How you're going to walk in your faith. What you're going to do with your faith. How you're going to see yourself. Not just outside of the faith box, but outside of the societal box as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and, so, yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. And just to remind us of where we started this evening, uh, when we saw how thoroughly um, Hebrews was really a part of Israel. And then the more we thought about what does it mean to be Israel, Israel doesn't have a central power. Israel is always interested in letting people make up imaginatively how God is in their particular setting. Um, and even today, it's so beautiful the way, I mean, if, if you talk to a Jewish friend, they'll know all about Jewish friends who are different than them. And they'll say, yeah, we'd like to argue, but um, that doesn't mean that um, uh, it's not good for us to be our particular selves in our particular communities. Now, I'm noticing how much I've failed um, this evening so far in that it's, we got five minutes left. 
And, and again, I think we need like three more sessions just to get started. But let me stop here and see, let's get as many people um, to say what they really need to say on their, on their mind from a question or a thought in the last four minutes. I mean, I can say other things, but let's, let's have, let's get some more voices. Uh, this is Margie. I have a case. I'm curious. Helen had brought up, how did Hebrews end up in the canon? And I wonder that too, if it's something that has not been studied much in the seminary and is so different, how did it, uh, how was it, do you think, uh, it got chosen to be part of the canon? Mm -hmm. So that, that, um, that, that is a, a clear question that I can answer pretty quickly. So I have written extensively on how the canon got put, got put together. And I have to say that nobody really knows. Um, uh, that is, uh, we were, I was taught, for instance, uh, fallaciously that um, uh, in seminary, that the that um, um, the Nicene Council did it. There's not a word in the Nicene Council about how the how the New Testament came into being. It looks like it took until at least the fifth century. Um, and 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 when I think of Irenaeus, who he's not talking about the New Testament yet, um, uh, or at least as a as a big book. But there, when he's trying to get uh, which of these like 23 Gospels should we all be reading, he picks four Gospels, not because they're the same, but because they're different. They're four winds that blow. I want to say the answer then to, to um, your question about how did Hebrews get in there, is this the seventh wind that blows? In other words, the designers, however the designers of the New Testament came, they weren't looking for sameness. Other thoughts or questions? Um, this is Carol Peterson. Hey, Carol. Um, it was very nice to join this, and I, I was very interested in the fact that it was going to be on Hebrews. Um, I had never read Hebrews, you know, just through, but discovered that many of the passages in Hebrews, either because they are quotes from other parts of the Bible, or because of themselves, mm -hmm. their favorite, you know, passages of mine. One of the things you said about it being like a fifth gospel, um, the one item that I had with me out in San, here in San Diego, other than Bible and um, those, was a little New Testament student edition by Stephen Harris. But the comment that was made there, which I underlined, um, was, whereas God formerly conveyed his message in fragmentary form through the Hebrew prophets, in Jesus he discloses a complete revelation of his essential nature and purpose. He goes on to say, as in Colossians and John's gospel, Jesus is the agent or goal of God's creative purpose and a perfect reflection of the divine being, referencing like the beginning of John's gospel. Mm -hmm. But I, I, in reading it, and also thought that, for instance, with Melchizedek, he's trying to use an analogy to, to bridge the concepts about God and Jesus and Jesus's mission to familiar territory, even though apart from Genesis and one little reference in Psalms, yeah. Melchizedek only appears and he extensively appears in Hebrews. Thank you. I really appreciate your sessions. Um, oh, you're, it's a pleasure to join them. Yeah. Well, Shirley, let me talk. Uh, turn back over to you. It's, it's been a, a great uh, uh, chance to be together. I apologize for not getting everything out there. Thanks, everyone, for your participation. This was the June 1st, 2020 Tanho Monday Textual Studies discussion on creativity in and 
Rejection of Hebrews, led by Dr. Hal Tossig. Once a month from 8 to 9 Eastern Time on Monday nights, generally the fourth of the month, the Tanho Center provides a discussion of one of the early Christian texts. Dr. Hal Tossig leads each session and shares a well-framed overview of the particular text. He allows discussion participants time to share their insights as well. Donations supporting the creation of these textual study archives are greatly appreciated. To donate, please simply click on the Tanho Monday Textual Studies button on the Early Christian Text homepage. You'll also find the donation button to, directly to Early Christian Text so that we can keep hosting the website. And thank you so much. And we'd like to thank Hal especially for another stimulating and wonderful discussion about the book of Hebrews. Thanks, Hal. Mm, thank you.